Today is a very special day. At least I think today is a very special day for me. Uh, I believe that today is my spiritual birthday. Uh, it it might have been last Sunday. I I I it was either the 23rd or the 30th of June, 1987. Uh, I confessed Jesus Christ as God Almighty and Savior of my soul. And the only way to get into heaven when I leave this world. If you know your spiritual birthday, celebrate it. All of our children, we celebrate their spiritual birthdays uh, because you get two birthdays. You get to be born, and then you have the opportunity to choose to be born again. And it's worth celebrating. And in all those years, in all those years uh, that I have been a Christian, I cannot remember anyone ever teaching me how to pray. I don't even remember asking anyone to teach me how to pray. Prayer did not come naturally to me. But that's okay because it didn't come naturally to Jesus' disciples either. I want you to know that you're not alone if you struggle with prayer. I really want you to understand that today. You're not alone if you struggle with prayer. The Lord's Prayer, as it is called, is recorded twice for us, but at different times and in different contexts. The first time is during Jesus' most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 6, 9 to 13. At this point, Jesus has been ministering for about six to nine months, so he's pretty new on the scene in Israel. And he specifically teaches this prayer as part of a bigger narrative within his whole sermon. This is different from the context that we are going to look at today in Luke chapter 11, verses 1 to 4. Unfortunately, the, the projector doesn't want to work today, so if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn to Luke chapter 11, verses 1 to 4. I won't have anything up there for you to look at. In Luke chapter 11, uh, in verse 1, we have a picture of Jesus praying, and one of his disciples, one of his disciples on behalf of all the other disciples, after either watching Jesus pray or seeing him come back from his prayer time, has a request. He says, Lord, teach us to pray as John the Baptist taught his disciples to pray. This happens about a year after. So now you follow the timeline. We're now a year later. Jesus preached prayer, the, the Lord's Prayer on the Sermon on the Mount. Now we're going a year ahead. And now the disciples have spent almost two years with Jesus. And it took them this long to need to learn how to pray. What sticks out to me most is their request is to learn how to pray like John the Baptist taught his disciples to pray. Even after two years with Jesus, his closest followers were still not fully grasping who Jesus was. But let's not beat up on them for this. Because maybe you can relate to the disciples. I know I can. It wasn't like Jesus' disciples didn't know how to pray. They were all Jewish from birth. There are hundreds and thousands of prayers they would have learned to say over and over their whole life. Prayers for food being one of the most common. My children, their whole life growing up, were assigned, and they still have this, they were assigned a day in which they would say grace at the table. And so each of them would know it was their turn by which day of the week. And I've even added that now with my son-in-law and my daughter-in-law uh, and to, to spread it out. And when they were little, uh, my parents came for dinner one night and my children decided they wanted to ask grandpa to say grace. So grandpa says grace. And my son, Luke, who was probably around six years old at the time, was very impacted. There was a huge impact on Luke from my father's prayer. 
Because a few days later, it was Luke's turn to say grace. And Luke was so excited. I'd never seen him so excited. Big smile on his face. He crashed glass, his little hands together, and he with a big smile. And he said, two potatoes between the four of us. Thank you, God. There are no more of us. Let's eat. Because that's the prayer he heard from his grandpa. Most prayers, though, if we're being honest, are used like a tool for getting what we want from God. And when we get something we ask for, then we offer the most common type of prayer, which is, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. After almost two years with Jesus, something must have triggered in the hearts of the disciples as they were witnesses to the most remarkable life ever lived. Daily, they saw miracles. I want you to just think about this, what I'm about to say. Daily, they saw miracles, healings, deliverances. They heard the kingdom of God explained and God's plan for all of us for all eternity. And they made the connection between all of it and prayer. At this point, they're making a connection between everything they're hearing, everything they're seeing, and prayer. So Jesus answers their request to be taught to pray by taking the same prayer that he taught a year earlier that they would have heard, and he personalizes it. That's why it's different. I don't know if you've ever read them both going, they're different. This one Jesus personalizes. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. Now, I want you to compare. I want you to listen to what you just heard, and I want you to compare that with what the disciples are going to pray about two to three years later in Acts chapter 4, verses 29 to 31. To give you the context, Peter and John, two of Jesus' disciples, have been arrested. And they have been brought before the Jewish authorities for healing a man in Jesus' name and teaching about Jesus. They spent the night in jail for that. Then they were threatened to keep quiet, and then they were released. They went back to those who were also called Christians, and they prayed and listened to their prayer. Remember, this is two to three years after. Now, Lord, consider the threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the scriptures tell us that the place that they were meeting was shaken. The building moved. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke boldly the Word of God. Amen? This is the end result. Acts 4, 29 to 31, this is the end result of what the disciples were learning about prayer in the Lord's Prayer. This is what we are going to learn today. I pray that at the end of today, this building will shake. Jesus said, when you start When you pray, start like this. Father, period, full stop. 
Jesus is telling them and us that God Almighty, creator of everything, likes to be addressed as Father. Or if you would prefer, Daddy. Or Dad. This is the most personal form of relationship that a child can have with his father. Or her father. It conveys intimacy where your emotions as well as your intellect are involved. But it does not lose the respect, the awesomeness, and wonder that all children gladly bow their will to around the strongest person that they know. Little kids will tell you, my daddy's stronger than everyone. My daddy's the strongest person in the whole wide world. And our daddy in heaven is not only the strongest daddy in the whole world, <laughs> he is the strongest daddy, period. Full stop. Some of my greatest prayer times have had no words. Maybe you can relate. Some of my greatest prayer times have been me just sitting quietly in the presence of my daddy when time did not matter, just being around the strongest person I've ever known. Jesus is saying, don't rush in and be in such a hurry when you pray. It is not a drive through at Tim Hortons. A child is never in a hurry around his dad. I don't know if you've noticed that, if you've ever had sons or daughters. Your children are never in a hurry, and you're a dad. I mean, your children are never in a hurry. They just want to be around their dad. But they will learn to be in a hurry if that's how their dad is with them. Your heavenly father is rarely in a hurry with you. And I mean rarely, I mean maybe one or two or three times in your entire life will your heavenly father be in a hurry with you. He is not in a rush. His priority, your heavenly Father's priority, is always what you do, never how much you do. That's what he cares about. He cares about what is happening in the time that you're together, not how much you're doing. If you learn nothing else, if you truly learn nothing else today but relating to God as your Father, your life will change for the better every day. If the sermon ends now and you leave and you just participate in treating Him like your daddy, your life will get better every single day. Jesus tells His disciples to start with your attitude towards God before you move on. If you're going to pray, it's about an attitude check. Jesus says, start with Father. Jesus teaches us that we can approach God as our loving Father, not an unwilling king or boss that you're trying to beg for a gift from. He's your daddy. Once you connect on the relational level as a child to a father, then you'll be ready to move on to the next part of this prayer. That's how important father is. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Prayer begins as an act of praise. It took me a long time to get to that place in my own prayer life, to start my prayer time as an act of praise and adoration for, for who God is and what he is capable of doing. Before rushing to, here's all the things I need, God, 
Can I just praise you? Can I just adore you for who you are and what you are capable of doing? This is immediately followed by a declared desire for his kingdom to come and rule. So first we're praising him. It's an act of praise. And then immediately after the praise, we are desiring, we are declaring to God, your kingdom come. We want your kingdom to rule here on the earth. The greatest struggle with prayer that I never knew was that I made my God too little. I never knew that. I never understood. Because my prayer life as a young Christian 37 years ago was wrapped around my concept of God. And so I believed that God loves me and wants to give me the desires of my heart if I delight in him. Psalm 37 verse 4. God loves me and wants to give me the desires of my heart. If I delight in him, I had no idea how out of context I took that verse. And it really messed me up when more and more of my prayers didn't get answered. Or they did get answered, but not in the way that I wanted. I've been a Christian long enough to know now And to have seen that there are more people who have had this same experience in their prayer life than just me. I know I'm not alone in this understanding of prayer. What was I missing? What are we missing? Jesus taught that prayer is about your attitude towards God and yourself. That the prayer he wants us to pray is about our attitude towards him and ourself. You can never whittle God down to a manageable size and shape. And we do that in our prayers. We try to whittle him down. We try to make him manageable. We try to shape him to fit into the image that can give us what we want in our life. He's too big. We must always approach God with reverence and honor. Jesus actually gives two conditions. There's actually two conditions to get answered prayer. You want your prayers answered? Here are the two conditions. First, our prayers must line up with the goal of seeing God's name glorified. That's condition number one. That the goal of your prayer is that God is the one who is glorified, not you, not someone else, God. And the second condition is a desire to ask for God's kingdom on earth to look like it already does in heaven. We all want to get to heaven, but do you understand that Jesus says, I brought the kingdom down with me. We can experience the kingdom of God here now on the earth as a practice or as a rehearsal, more like a dress rehearsal for what it's going to be like in eternity with him. Without these conditions being met in your prayer life, your prayer life will be lifeless. You'll pray, you'll say the words, But if these conditions are not met, God is not going to give you what you want for your glory because God deserves the glory. But what about me? What about me and what I need from God? Because that is a very real thing, isn't it? We have needs. Let me ask you, Does your heavenly Father love you and know what you need? Will your own Father give you a snake when you ask for a fish? Or a scorpion when you ask for an egg? How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? 
it's been like 20 to 25 years. I've been a Christian for 37 years. It's been like 20 to 25 years since I learned that Jesus taught this prayer to his disciples so that they would end up with the Holy Spirit. That's the direction this prayer is going to lead us, to the Holy Spirit. Matthew's version of the prayer in Matthew 6, his version of the prayer has Jesus saying this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let me ask you a question. Who exactly is doing God's will both in heaven and on earth simultaneously? If you said the Holy Spirit, you'd be correct. Your first priority, my first priority, our first priority in prayer is to ask God the Holy Spirit to come into your life and fulfill God's will in you, for you, and through you as He is doing it in heaven. This prayer will always be answered with God's name being hallowed and his kingdom growing. Why is this important? Have you ever struggled with prayer because of all the thoughts and noises going on in your head? Have you ever tried to pray and it's just like, I can't, I, uh, uh, or you're in a prayer group or with other people, and you're listening to this person, he or she is praying uh, this incredibly eloquent, uh, beautifully worded supplication to God, and while that's going on, your brain is wondering if you forgot anything at the store. You're wondering about the problems that are happening at home. I want you to know that does not make you a bad person. Just a human one. You ask for the Holy Spirit so that your prayers can sort through the noise and clutter and allow you to become humble. Because when you ask for the Holy Spirit to come first, and He comes, you will get humbled. And it's a good thing to be in a place of humility before God. To hallow God's name in prayer and to ask for His kingdom to rule and not yours is the humility that Jesus wanted His disciples to get to so that they could learn to rely on the God of heaven and earth and not the God of their own making. That's so important. Because we can fall into the same trap of looking for a God of our own making. A God made in our image. I don't know if you've ever thought about the Ten Commandments. The first two is, you know, you'll have no God before me. The second one says, don't make a graven image. And I'm like, weren't those just a repeat? Isn't that like God just saying the same thing twice? No. No, God is telling us, I know that your temptation, I know that your sin-filled hearts will long for a God in your image that will want the things that you think you want. But Jesus says, I want you to learn how to rely on the God of heaven and earth. And this is exactly what happens in Acts chapter 4. These same disciples were now under threats and pressure for carrying on the work of Jesus. They're simply going around telling people how amazing Jesus is. And they're healing people. And they're delivering demons out of people. And other people didn't like that. And they were threatened for being a follower of Jesus. And I want you to look at what they learned from Jesus' prayer just two to three years later. They said this, Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. This is after being released from prison or, and, and after all of the threats. 
Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the holy name of Jesus. But look at what happens next. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all, underline all, filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word boldly. I've heard so many people over my Christian life talk about their fear about speaking their faith to other people. They feel shy, bashful. They don't think they have good words. Acts chapter 4 says they prayed and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit empowered them to not just speak the word, but to speak it boldly. They asked for God's enabling to speak God's word with boldness. And how did God answer? He filled them with the Holy Spirit. And then they were able to speak the word God boldly, even though they knew that they were threatened to keep quiet. This is a life-changing prayer. Prayer is so much more than asking God to help you make it through the day. And yet, it's actually part of what Jesus taught us to pray. He says, give us each day our daily bread. This is a prayer of faith. And for faith to be real, it must bank on the character of God. That's what this prayer, this request, give us each day our daily bread is referring back to when God commanded Israel while they were traveling from Egypt to the new land and home that God had promised them and their forefathers. If you go way back in your Bible to Exodus chapter 16, verses 11 to 21, we're not going to read them, I'll just tell you the story. In Exodus 16, it tells us that God commanded Israel to only gather enough manna for today. They thought at one point they could cheat it, (laughs) gather some more, some extra. And if you want to read the rest of the story, it it, it didn't go well uh, with them for trying to outmaneuver God. There's a lesson. Jesus wants to teach us a lesson. The lesson is we are not to worry about the future because the future is not yet known to us. This part of Jesus' prayer is really saying this to God. I believe you will supply all I need physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually for the entire day. And I will not worry about tomorrow because you have given me everything I need for today. To live your life as a follower of Jesus is very much like the alcoholic that goes to AA. In AA, they are told You are to live your life one day at a time. Your focus is today. We are being told by Jesus to ask for our daily bread today. But there's something really cool about the the grammatical tense uh, in the the Greek uh, in, in this verse. The grammatical uh, tense means keep asking. Keep asking. Jesus is teaching that you don't just have to ask once at the beginning of the day and then forget about it. It's okay to keep asking for whatever part of your daily bread God has in store for you. He, we heard that in the second public reading of, of the widow that went to the unjust judge. And he finally just says at the end, he said, I don't fear God, but you are wearing me out, lady. 
And so I am going to give you justice. Whatever part of it is, I want you to know this because so often we think of daily bread as what is the physical need that I have? But I'm telling you, you need to keep asking for your mental bread, your emotional bread, your spiritual bread. This is not about what you think you want, but what God knows you need. I believe this is what Jesus meant when he said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Why? Because Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And so when you're asking for the daily bread, God, I want me, I want you to give me daily bread. Will you give us this day our daily bread? You are saying, Jesus, you are my daily bread. Give me as much of you as I need today. His character is what you base this request for daily bread on. One of God's names is Jehovah Jireh. And it literally means God, my provider. This prayer request demands a step out into the unknown where faith grows through practice. It really does. This is that faith part of the prayer. And by waiting, sorry, and when we practice, when we practice faith, we learn to wait. If you're going to practice faith, you're going to learn how to wait. And by waiting, we are showing God the posture of our hearts. Remember that humility part? When we're praying, God, give me this day. Give us this day, our daily bread. I'm waiting. My posture is humble. I know that you will provide because you are God, my provider, and you will not let me down. This posture of your heart means everything to God when you pray. And the reason is because God sees prayer, this part of the prayer, as a two-way exercise. Daily bread is not always a question of trusting God for what you want, but sometimes about God being able to entrust us with His provision. He wants you to wait because he may want to give you something big. And he wants you to be ready and able and willing with what he entrusts you with that you will actually do with it its intended purpose to glorify his name and build his kingdom. The more you receive from God, the more responsible you are to Him for what He gives you. That's why they say jokingly, be careful what you ask for because God might give it to you and then hold you accountable for it later on. Can we overcome Can we overcome our desires, our passions, and emotions to stay in the center of God's will daily? Please understand something. This does not mean you go and sell everything you have and give it all away and wait for God to feed you, to clothe you, and to house you. You're allowed to own stuff. Some of you are like, ooh, I was about ready to leave. But you are allowed to own stuff. You are allowed to enjoy the fruits of your labor. Because this request to God goes so much deeper than money and physical needs. And I believe that is why Jesus teaches this part of the Lord's Prayer before the very next line. The very next line says, Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. You will need your daily bread in order to live out knowing forgiveness and giving it to others. You're going to need every bit of that daily bread 
to understand knowing forgiveness from God and giving forgiveness to those who sin against you. Jesus taught that forgiveness starts with you and God and then shows its impact on you by your willingness to give it to those who sin against you. And the thing about when people sin against you is that in your mind, in my mind, the thought is, you don't deserve this. (laughs) You made me mad. I want to do some things to you. And God says, we start with you and God. And when that forgiveness is, you don't deserve his forgiveness. I don't deserve his forgiveness. And when that gets dealt with, The impact on you should be so great that you can offer that to those who sin against you. When you sin, or when we sin, we become indebted to the one we sin against. I'm not sure if you understand that, but when we sin, we actually become indebted to the one we sin against. Our sin breaks trust. It breaks closeness, value, and everything that makes life worth living. Forgiveness offers back life. Forgiveness offers back life. But in a new relationship where guilt and shame and pride and arrogance and fear and anger and vengeance are replaced with grace, reconciliation, and restoration. Amen. Why Jesus wants us to pray this prayer is because an unforgiving heart cannot be in a condition to accept forgiveness from God. I sometimes still feel guilt and shame even after I've asked God for his forgiveness through confessing my sins as we are taught to do in 1 John 1.9. And when I'm feeling that way, takes time, but eventually I will remember that I have some unforgiveness that I'm not extending to somebody else who sinned against me. Or maybe they didn't sin against me, they sinned against somebody I know and care about. Very difficult to take up the offense of someone else. We're forbidden from doing that. And when I do that, when I realize I have still not forgiven that person, and that this is what's standing in the way of God forgiving me. And I'm telling you, I testify to you, as I am able to release that person through forgiveness, I feel that forgiveness come on to me from God. And it's overwhelming sometimes knowing how God works. This part of the prayer, this part of the prayer about forgiving is a declaration of understanding about what forgiveness is. A very serious matter of how your daily life is lived. The Bible says, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Because you plant a seed that will grow and it will take over a whole bunch of parts of your life. My wife and I have been married for almost 34 years. And I can think back to those early years in marriages, in our marriage, where we just have all these fights (laughs) and arguments. And we, we, we don't have very many of those anymore. And for me, the biggest reason is because I realize that if I say or do something that hurts her, and she identifies that to me, that I'm hurt, that I'm in pain because of what you said or what you did, that by saying I'm sorry and meaning it and letting her know that I understand that I was wrong, that declaration of understanding of what forgiveness is impacts your daily life. 
It's a prayer that says, I know in whose hands judgment belongs, and I leave it there. Can you do that? Can you leave it there? And finally, we have, I lead us not into temptation. This is in. We're going to land the plane, everybody. Lead And lead us not into temptation. I want you to know, temptation is coming for all of you. Temptation is really coming for all of us. And we must own that in our prayer life. We must own the fact that temptation is coming after us. One, because we have an enemy named Satan. And two, we have a heart that was born into sin. Jesus is teaching this prayer at about the halfway point of his ministry. So to give you a timeline, Jesus is at about halfway through his ministry. And now if we go forward near the end of his ministry, he's going to bring this specific issue up again with his disciples in Matthew chapter 26, verse 41. He's going to say on the last night before he's arrested and then he's going to be crucified, uh, he says to his disciples, we're going to go pray. And he says to them, watch and pray so you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus says this right before he's about to face his most important temptation. Jesus is going to ask his Father in heaven three times if there is any other way to save the world that doesn't include him having to die on a cross. I think that's a, a very good and right prayer to pray. And each time he comes back from his prayer time, he finds his disciples having a prayer meeting. No. If you know the story, he finds his disciples sleeping. He even scolds them. He scolds them for sleeping. And then again, he asks them to watch and pray. And he comes back again. And they're Sleeping. Now, it is the middle of the night, but they were sleeping when they should have been praying. The third time, at least one of them must have stayed awake because someone had to tell Luke, the writer of the gospel that gives us what Jesus says and that we need to hear, where Jesus says to his Father in heaven after asking, can we have this cross thing removed? And Jesus says, yet not my will, but yours be done. But it's what happens next that fascinates me. After Jesus says that, an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. That is fascinating to me. That in his temptation, Jesus says, not my will, but your will be done. And God delivered an angel from heaven to come and strengthen him. I want you to know that God will not lead you into temptation in case you're wondering. In case you're new to this journey with Jesus and you're looking at this going, why am I praying don't lead me into temptation? God will not lead you into temptation. James chapter 1 verse 113 says this, When tempted, no one should say God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. This part of the prayer is your confession, not my will, but your will be done, Father. But with a new perspective and understanding, because you choose to engage 
your temptations with God in prayer. This is something that I have been very bad at in my 37 years walking with Jesus. Instead of going to God in prayer immediately with the temptation in front of me, I'll do this. I can handle it. I got this one, God. This one's not going to get me. And maybe it doesn't. Maybe not the next one, but the next one. And then that one over here. Jesus said, watch and pray that you do not fall into temptation because the temptation is coming. This entire prayer taught by Jesus can be summed up in one sentence. And some of you are going, why did you take 40 minutes to get to that? If you could say it in one sentence. God wants you to exchange your perspectives and understandings for his. God wants you to exchange your perspectives and understandings for his. That's the Lord's prayer. My hope today is that I've been able to shine a light on God's perspectives and his understanding about prayer and inspire you to look again at what Jesus taught in this old familiar prayer and that he wants you to engage him he wants you to engage him in as he prepares us for what his disciples learned. He wants us to be prepared like his disciples were prepared so that we would experience Acts chapter 4 and beyond. And it's available to anyone who asks, Lord, teach me how to pray. Except for one thing. They said, Lord, teach us how to pray. The power that God wants to unleash on the world through his church is when the church is community, not singular. When the church says, teach us how to pray. And when the church says, we will pray this together the room will be shaken. The Holy Spirit will fill you. You will speak the word of God boldly. And the next time I come here, every chair will be full. Amen? Amen.